mind and body, and they empower the warrior to face life or death with equal calm and resolve. Now, as never before seen, watch as the ancient teachings, practices, and rituals surrounding the world's most awesome martial arts are revealed in The Secrets of the Warrior's Power. According to martial arts legend, in 1566, a band of English traders turned for shelter to a Buddhist monastery at the foot of the Songshan Mountains in the Henan province of northern China. The name of the monastery was the Shaolin Temple. Inside the Temple of a Thousand Buddhas were the elite martial arts warriors of China, the soldier monks of Shaolin, engaged in a spectacle that was unlike anything these Westerners had seen before. But in the climate of dynastic intrigue and repression that characterized the dying days of the Ming Dynasty, the martial techniques under practice were a closely guarded secret. Questioned by the traders, their guide would offer only one explanation. Kung Fu, he said. They are training to master an art. The films of Bruce Lee and others brought Chinese Kung Fu to audiences of millions worldwide. Today, the term Kung Fu is synonymous with the traditional fighting arts of China, arts that many believe are the basis of all of the Asian fighting systems. When compared to Korean Taekwondo or Japanese Karate, for example, some of the differences are easily visible. Kung Fu is generally distinguished by more fluid movements, an emphasis on learning many weapons, and its colorful traditional dress. It is, some believe, the most beautiful of all the martial arts. But save for an initiated few, the true nature of Kung Fu remains a mystery. It began with one man, a Buddhist monk, the third son of a Brahmin Indian king. His name was Bodhidharma. In 527 AD, Bodhidharma went to China to the court of the Chinese Emperor Wu. Buddhism, he learned, had been tampered with. It was no longer just an internal mental act of devoting oneself to Buddha, but one that now took specified public acts of devotion. Rituals involving calligraphy, the adornment of shrines, and the building of tributes honoring Buddha. When the emperor asked for Bodhidharma's reaction to the great temples and shrines he constructed to honor Buddha, Bodhidharma replied, these are but as shadows of the forest. They are empty and have no substance. Bodhidharma would have to tackle the problem at its source, the legendary Shaolin Temple in northern China. There are two schools of thought on what happened after Bodhidharma left the emperor's court. One is that he went to the Shaolin Temple and he found them so secularized, so worried about money and worldly things, that he left them in disgust. He refused to teach them his special muscle changes philosophy, which blends mind and body harmony in the martial arts that we know today. He goes off to a cave, he stares at a wall for nine years. The second school of thought is that instead of going to the Shouting Temple first, he just went to the cave 
stayed there for nine years meditating while disciples came seeking attention until he found a disciple worthy of the information he had to impart. In the tenth year, in a bid to become his first disciple, a monk severed his left arm. His act was the first evidence that Bodhidharma's message had been understood. What mattered was not the external, but the internal. Bodhidharma rose to the side of his first disciple, in whose honor the Shaolin monks would from then on salute Buddha with only one hand. It was time for the teachings to begin. Bodhidharma was a proponent of the concept of chi, the vital energy or essence or life force that we all hold within us. This is a primary concept that's held within the Chan Buddhistic school of thought, or Zen Buddhism as we know it in the West. This chi, or vital essence, could be focused within, taking that inner focus and developing it through mental, spiritual, and physical discipline, which we know as the martial arts. You could aim that energy toward parts of your body. He called this linking energy. And then he could explode that energy into a part of his body for healing purposes, perhaps. That would be called exploding energy. This interworking with the chi is a very important part of all Chinese martial arts and the essence of the peaceful interdisciplinary aspect of martial arts worldwide. Through Bodhidharma at Shaolin, the theory was it would be possible to maximize external physical strength by maximizing internal strength, the flow of the chi. For the monks of Shaolin, this meant one thing, survival. Throughout the temple's history, the monks had faced what appeared to be an irreconcilable conflict. They had to defend themselves against the threats posed by constantly shifting political alliances, while at the same time preserving the spiritual harmony that defined a life dedicated to Buddha. If Bodhidharma's beliefs and teachings about Qi were accurate, the monks' ability to worship was also the basis of their ability to ward off aggressors. That was the theory. The question was, would Bodhidharma's theory work? In medicine, the existence of this unifying force, or Qi, has long formed a very basis for the practice of acupuncture. In 652 AD, Sun Shumao found that Qi flowed along precise meridians between the body's organs. Using tiny electrical charges generated by acupuncture stimulation, he could affect this energy field and redress imbalances, remove blockages, and ultimately heal patients. For contemporary Kung Fu practitioners, the existence of Qi has never been under question. When properly focused, this is the energy that enables them to transcend the physical limitations of flesh and blood and perform feats that appear to challenge the impossible. In the 20th century, the advent of electromagnetic imaging technologies enabled Chinese scientists to gather proof of Qi's existence. The monks of the 6th century Shaolin Temple, though, could not turn to science. They had to put Bodhidharma's theory to the test. To maximize Qi, they meditated. To maximize linking energy, they practiced a form which became known as the Lohan, a series of 18 unique movements that, when combined with the right breathing technique, refined mind-body coordination. To develop explosive energy, they followed a training regimen of unparalleled severity, a regimen with one objective, to create a warrior whose resolve 
no aggressor could disturb. The tests of the Shaolin were no less extreme. The final test, given before a monk was allowed to become an emissary of the temple, was known formally as the Hall of the Wooden Men, to the monks as the Corridor of Death. It was a test in which monks who lacked the capacity to defend themselves and their temple died an often painful death. The test consisted of a long corridor lined with 108 mechanical dummies primed to randomly release weapons with deadly precision and force. Blocking the exit sat a burning 300-pound cauldron. For those who reached the cauldron, the reward was the intense pain of burning flesh and the indelible brands of the Shaolin. A tiger on one arm and a dragon on the other. To survive was a victory of the Qi. The annals of Chinese history testify eloquently to the effectiveness of the Shaolin martial arts. And for more than 400 years, the temple prospered, but the political climate eventually shifted. Their techniques became something of a threat to the political powers of the day. By the 1570, the Manchus decided either the Shaolin monks were going to fall in line and tell them that they would serve them or there'd be a problem. Shaolin monks neglected to respond in time and the Manchu forces came and obliterated the temple. The monks who survived went underground to keep the fighting arts alive and formed the secret societies known as the Triads. For the next 300 years, the Triads became a focal point for political resistance. Arts came in the 20th century during the Chinese Cultural Revolution. With the rise of communism, the Chinese government under Mao Zedong denounced all practice of the martial arts as futile and superstitious. Practitioners faced brutality at best. At worst, execution. Seeking refuge, many fled to Hong Kong. There, it is believed, Kung Fu would have died and the teachings of Bodhidharma remained the property of myth, if not for a man named Run Run Shaw. For an investment of $100,000, Shaw discovered, you could capture the heretofore secretive action of Chinese Kung Fu on film and recoup a seven-figure profit. As the secrets of the masters were transferred to celluloid, Shaw Brothers Studios went on to become the largest motion picture company in Hong Kong. For traditionalist masters such as Yip Man, these films were not well regarded. Where he had taught that the secrets of Kung Fu had to be learned through a process of mastery, they could now be bought for the price of a ticket. But it was one of Yip Man's students who became arguably the most popular martial arts film star ever. A Chinese-American, Bruce Lee. Chinese Kung Fu. Bruce Lee epitomized the new Kung Fu of the movie house. But he also broke the mold. Lee hungered for knowledge and delved deeper into the philosophies that underpinned his ability. Bruce Lee had a dynamic stage presence, so it's easy to forget some personal aspects of his life. He actually had 3,000 books or more in his library, all of which he read. He was a philosophy major at the University of Washington. He combined his standard westernized traditional philosophy background with the philosophy background he'd been born and lived with of his own culture, the Eastern background. And you see this combination of East and West in his films and his books. 
At age 27, Lee's beliefs took shape. He broke with Yip Man to form a new martial art. It was called Jeet Kune Do, the way of the intercepting fist. Unlike the traditional martial arts, Jeet Kune Do had no rules or classifications, yet it shared many of their stances and techniques. It offered the warrior freedom from the confines of style, enabling him to respond better and faster in combat. For Lee, the same philosophy applied to his teaching. I cannot teach you, Lee told his students. I can only help you explore yourselves. But Lee was not alone in keeping alive the spirit of the arts. The year was 1978, and the Beijing police were at an impasse. China's triad gangs, their martial techniques intact, had resurfaced with a criminal focus and appeared to threaten the very rule of law. Powerless to stop them since handguns had been banned, the police turned to their last resort, Pan Ching Fu. The man who at the age of 30 had already been a national legend for nearly 20 years. Thanks to him, 23 triad gang leaders were brought to justice. Some, Grandmaster Pan captured single-handedly. Pan didn't just know the gangster's techniques. He had one they couldn't counter. Like the monks of the Shaolin, Pan trains in what is known as the iron body style of Kung Fu. The monks developed iron body training focus and intensify their chi to harden their bodies. By punching or hitting an object with increasing force hundreds of times every day, eventually, it is said, the body becomes like iron itself. For over 38 years, Master Pan has trained his iron fist by hitting a steel block 1,000 times a day. Now, Anything less than steel would shatter. How very, very useful. It's very just useful. One just one punch, punch and they are unconscious, for just sure. I only power. use about 30% power. Because it's very strong, very hot. And I, I have power, speed of power. Although he is quite comfortable now in his home in Canada, Master Pan's life was much more difficult as a youngster orphaned at the age of six, and living in the crime-ridden city of Qingdao, Pan needed a means of protecting his younger brother and sister. He turned to the Zen Buddhist principles articulated 13 centuries earlier at Shaolin. It wasn't long before he earned the nickname Shaolahu, or Small Tiger, because of his skill and aggressiveness. After studying with 15 masters, he went on to teach, eventually becoming the lead national coach of the People's Republic of China and one of China's most respected martial artists. Pan has other names, including the Eagle Claw and Sifu Pan. But the most common comes from the 1990 cult martial arts feature Iron and Silk. To audiences worldwide, he is known from that film as the Iron Fist. Couched in the title of Iron and Silk is one of the great secrets of Kung Fu, the secret of yin and yang, female and male. It is known as the principle of opposites. Heat cannot exist without cold. To have light, there must be dark. Ultimately, the theory goes, they become one in the same. According to the Chinese, yin is the soft, passive, negative force. Yang, the hard, active, positive one. Part of Pan Ching Fu's power rests on his ability to summon both at will. Power, 
speed and power and the archery. Master Pan's speed power archery, also speed. comes from continuous, rigorous training. Yeah. To maintain flexibility, daily stretching for nearly every part of his body is a necessity. This stretching, plus placing 200 pounds of steel on his extended legs every day, helps him stay limber and cultivate what Bodhidharma called the linking energy needed for chi. Must be do your best. Do you understand? Yes, yes sir! Go on! Master Pan also teaches the explosive energy that maximizes the student's capacity to deliver the chi. As in most Kung Fu schools, strict discipline goes hand in hand with a close camaraderie. Neck, grab shoulder. The self-defense techniques of Kung Fu, developed from centuries of practical application, are simple yet effective. They can stop nearly every opponent in his tracks. If it doesn't hurt, you're probably doing something wrong. Students also learn many mixed weapons forms, such as the long army lance and spear, and the staff and spear. The spear is a weapon as ancient as Chinese culture itself. To master it is a milestone for the aspiring disciple. The Chinese spear, both in 9 and 18 foot lengths, combined a thrusting point with a slicing blade. It was a devastating weapon. For foot soldiers, it was one of the last defenses against oncoming cavalry. In the 1800s, the British acknowledged its superiority over their bayonet. The Tai Chi sword, a lesser known component of the popular art of Tai Chi Chuan, and the double broadsword forms. Spinning swords that can turn a man into a windmill of death. The broadsword is one of the most widely used weapons in Kung Fu. Light and maneuverable, it evolved from the long-handled knives the Chinese used before 200 AD. The brightly colored silk scarves are not only ornamental, they confuse and distract one's opponent. The broadsword has only one cutting edge. The warrior that advances with it must also be prepared to defend himself. The blade of the broadsword can easily cut through a coat of armor and the adversary within. Open stomach very easily. Take it head up. Yeah, quickly. The chain whip complete with metal barbs and easily enclosed in a hand or garment, first presents the yin of defenselessness, then the yang of the surprise assault. The weighted end of the spinning chain can exceed speeds of 170 miles per hour. All of these, both empty-handed and weapons forms, heighten the student's mind-body coordination. As were the Shaolin monks, the culmination of practice for Pan and his students is control over the Qi. One of the most challenging and difficult regiments Master Pan teaches is the Kung Fu breakfall form. 
The break fall form builds suppleness and pliability, so the warrior can attack like iron, yet land without injury like silk. Again, the yin and yang. Because of the many dedicated Kung Fu practitioners, Master Pan and others, there's been a surge of new interest in the Chinese martial arts. The epicenter of that movement, it appears, is still rooted in Shaolin. Auspices of the government has been declared a national treasure. Once again, it is the testing ground for the teachings of Bodhidharma, a testing ground whose rigor has changed little over the millennium. Part of the Kung Fu training regimen involves strengthening the muscles and toughening the body through repeated exercises. To strengthen the neck muscles, the Shaolin warrior may hang himself for 30 minutes or more at a time. Other regimens to develop the chi are no less difficult. Headbutting helps the Shaolin monks toughen their skulls. Resisting blows to the abdomen, where the chi is said to reside, builds internal strength and focus. It can take as little as eight pounds of pressure to crack the human skull. Skillful manipulation of his chi, though, prevents this monk from getting hurt. This is the art of hard qigong. For the monks, as well as many traditional Chinese masters, hard qigong is an art form still widely practiced today. By focusing his chi, this master is able to make his body impervious to the blade of the sword, just as his warrior ancestors did thousands of years earlier. For over 15 centuries, the skill of hard qigong has protected the monks of Shaolin from assault. But a new assailant has emerged for which the techniques of Bodhidharma are ill-equipped. The tourist. Glorified by the media, the Shaolin temple, still a holy shrine and monastery, has become a popular attraction. However, like countless times before, the ancient principles of Kung Fu are adapting and surviving, this time by moving to the new world, New York City. It is here in downtown Manhattan that Chinese monk Shi Yanming has opened the USA Shaolin Temple. To those who hunger for knowledge, he teaches the values and martial arts made famous at Shaolin. Monk Shi Yanming began his 25-year study of Chan Buddhism and Shaolin Kung Fu at the age of five. In 1992, he came to the United States. His motives, he believes, were those of Bodhidharma 15 centuries ago. I want to stay here and teach Chinese Buddhism, Chinese culture, and Shaolin martial arts. And I want to help promote world peace. Though New York City may seem like one of the last places he would like to teach his arts, monk Shi Yanming is quite content. As he says, 
the whole world is home to a Buddhist monk. The Shaolin martial arts belong to everyone. But China remains the source. Long term, he hopes to build a larger school and set up a cultural exchange.